Okay. So uh, this is Angular Up. My name is Rob Wormald, as he said, uh, Roberto Wormaldio. Nice. Uh, I am a developer programs engineer on the Angular team at Google. Uh, I'm called a DPE at work. People ask me what this means. It basically just means I'm a developer advocate, but I get to write slightly more code, which is nice. Uh, as you said, I also started the NGRX project. I more or less have kind of stepped away from that project. I'm like the spiritual leader of NGRX now. Uh, Mike and Brandon do a really good job of running it without my support. Uh, so they're doing a great job, but that was my baby to start with. Uh, I'm also now Angular's rep for web standards. So, you know, we work at Google, we have the Chrome team who are doing a huge amount of work on web standards. Uh, historically, some of those standards may have not been exactly what frameworks needed. So part of the work that, that our team and the Chrome team and, and myself specifically are doing is uh, helping the Chrome team, helping the web browser teams build standards that are useful, build standards that are you know, going to be useful for people using frameworks, things that we can compile to. So generally, you know, the future looks good for some of the standards coming down the pipeline. Uh, I'm Rob Wormald just about everywhere. That's one of the great things about having a kind of crazy, unique last name. Uh, so that's me on Twitter and on GitHub and on Facebook and on any social site that exists. Uh, please do follow me on Twitter because I'm nearly to 10,000 followers and that's like a goal for this year for me. So if we can do that, that would be great. So every time we do one of these keynotes, we like to talk about community because that's why we're all here, right? Uh, I think probably the coolest thing about my job is that my job is the community and it's really nice to be able to basically go any city in the world, any country in the world and kind of immediately have hundred people to talk to, right? So we love the community. You guys are the reason that we do what we do. Uh, just for an update on that, that's, we're seeing about 1.4, 1.5 million active 30-day users on angular.com or angular.io. This is great. This is up from something like 1.1, 1.2 at ng-conf. So we're seeing consistent, continual growth on numbers arriving at the docs, which is good to see. We also have something like 800 plus worldwide meetups at this point. We've almost lost track. This means that there are like two meetups a day somewhere in the world every day, which is really, really awesome. And again, it means that I can go to any city in the world and crash one of these meetup parties and be like, hey, I work on the Angular team. Let me talk to you. So that's cool. Uh, of course, NG Girls, this is a, a, an amazing, amazing effort. I think, believe there's one tomorrow. I'll be hopefully coming to that. Uh, I got to sit in on one of these for the first time in Mountain View a couple of months ago. Uh, and actually, one of the things that was really surprising to me was how useful it was for us as engineers on the core team. OK, so as I was saying, uh, we get a totally fresh perspective. We get to see people who've never used the framework before. Uh, like one of the things that came up for me was we're used to having like an HTML file, a TS file, and a CSS file, right? And one of the things that was really clear to me was that people who'd never used this framework before, they had a really hard time linking those things up, right? Switching between the files and kind of keeping all of that in their brain. And that was something that was completely surprising to me, right? And maybe it shouldn't have been, but I had no idea and it really, it was a really useful thing and it's got us thinking about some of the new stuff we can do, right? Can we make that better? Can we make that easier? So these things are, are both awesome, but they're also extremely useful for us. So we really, really like to see those. Uh, if you haven't used StackBlitz, this is another thing that's come from the community. Uh, this is just an amazing, amazing online editor. It does, you know, live reload and TypeScript and auto-completion and all the stuff that we really like. It all works on the web. Very, very cool. Uh, these guys actually run the Angular docs now. So, like, all of the examples on Angular.io are all running on StackBlitz. This makes it super easy to fork. You know, you can clone one of these repos. It'll, it'll actually run with the CLI when you get downloaded from StackBlitz. So, in general, we think this is awesome. We're investing in them. There's a ton of really cool stuff coming down the pipeline. So if you haven't checked this out, certainly, certainly do. So you're all developers, and this is, this is why we do this, right? So that you can build things. We can develop things. Uh, one of my jobs as a DPE is really being what we call the, the zero-width customer. So it's my job to kind of take whatever comes out of the core team and go, that's awesome, or you're crazy, there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to tell the community that you're going to do this, right? So we get to have a little bit of that first check. V6, we did a lot of that work. So uh, things that we did that were sort of important here. One of the things we did was we aligned the release schedule, right? So it used to be really, really hard to keep track of what version of what, 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 what. You know, you're always dealing with peer dependencies. In Angular 6 Plus, obviously that's much simpler. We've just aligned the library releases so everything is just 6.0. It will all go to 7.0 together. This makes it easier for everybody. Nice little trick. Uh, the CLI, we've done obviously a huge amount of investment in the CLI. And I think probably 
there was more work in the CLI on 5 and 6, or between 5 and 6, than there was actually kind of in the core framework. Uh, one of the biggest things for that is schematics, right? Anybody using schematics? Um, any of you, all of you should be using schematics. Okay, let me ask you this question. Who's using the CLI? Okay, so all of you are actually using schematics, right? So trick question. So schematics are what actually let CLI generate code, right? They do your components and your directives and pipes and all that good stuff. Um, but we've added these new two facilities here, update and add, both very, very cool. So the idea of ng-update is that when you are going to ship a new version of a package or we're going to ship a new version of a package, you can actually write some code that does this transformation, right? If you've renamed an API or renamed a symbol, we can actually describe that in the ng-update and then when somebody actually just runs this command, you know, they can modify that package. So you can actually automate the upgrade, which, which we think is gonna be very, very cool. Early days on this, but there's a lot that we think we can do with this. So having the infrastructure in place is important and hopefully, you know, we'll see more and more starting to use stuff like ng-update. So it'll update your code and, uh, you know, we're doing this for v6, so rxjs can do this, material can do this. So if you're on v5 right now, certainly try out the ng-update stuff to get up to v6. Uh, ng-add, this is actually really cool as well. So this is kind of along the same lines. You add a little bit of extra metadata into your package.json. The CLI is able to pick up on that. And we can basically install capabilities for you. So rather than you doing an npm install and then you know going to the docs and just copying and pasting from the docs like we all do, uh, ng-add will actually just go ahead and insert this code for you. So it's a little bit like having an installer in the old sort of Windows days, right? So ng-add, very, very cool. Uh, they can do code and you know library scaffolding. All of these things on the Angular core framework are using ng-add. So if you do you know ng-add Angular PWA, it's going to add a service worker for you. It's going to configure the service worker for you. If you do Angular Elements ng-add, it's going to add the polyfills. It's going to scaffold one out for you. The material does the same thing. You know it adds all the, the CSS things like that. We're starting to see third-party libraries begin to do this. Clarity, native script, etc. This one is really cool, and actually this is the one that I didn't really think about too much until it came out. So this is the ability to have in a schematic, like a specific kind of sub-schematic, if you like. And I think Hans will probably yell at me for using the term sub-schematic. But these are kind of named schematics. So in this case, we're using Angular Material, but we actually want to generate a navigation kind of component, right? So not just like install Material, but install Material and generate some specific feature for me. So this is going to be very powerful, we think, for component libraries. If you're, a, if you're a kind of library that ships, you know, a dozen components, you can set up very specific kind of boilerplate uh, kind of scaffolding so that you can set up an app very, very quickly. This is extremely useful in enterprise. This is extremely useful for like a consultant, right? You're always creating new apps. So definitely check out the, the generated stuff. This was a big win for us, right? So one of the things that's been historically really difficult uh, has been building an NPM package using Angular. Uh, we added this to the CLI. I think this was probably the single most requested feature in the history of Angular. Uh, people wanted to be able to use the CLI to build libraries, to build shippable code. We've added that into the, into the CLI, so you know, we can scaffold a project for you. It does testing, it does all your build system setup. So it's really, really, really nice and easy to get a library set up really, really quickly. Now, developers, yes. Community, yes. But often we're building these applications for end users, right? And this is what we've been focusing a lot on uh, after the v6 release. So we're really doing a lot of work to make sure that Angular not only has the best dev experience for everybody who's using it, but also you know, makes it easy to get the best user experience. One step we made uh, in this direction, which is sort of counterintuitive if you think, because this is like a highly technical feature, right? Tree shakeable providers. One of the reasons we did this though is that you're not paying the full cost of every single service you use up. Front. And of course, the reason for this is so that you're shipping less code in your applications, and of course, that's a better user experience, right? So tree shackle providers, these are documented, but effectively it means that you can declare a service, you don't have to put it in a module, and if and when you actually decide to use it, at that point, it will be loaded into the injector and kind of work. But it allows you to lazy load anything you want. Uh, we are in the process of for taking parts of the router, for example, and making them lazy loadable. So it'll kind of break things apart. Same thing for animations. In general, this adds a lot of flexibility, which is going to allow you to build smaller apps. Right. Now, I'm up here talking about smaller apps and this and the other, but really this is what I think everybody wants to hear about, right? So uh, raise your hand if you haven't heard of Ivy yet. Great, I get to tell some people about this for the first time. So 
Ivy is kind of our code name. Uh, it doesn't really officially mean anything, and there's actually debate on the team itself as to what Ivy actually means. Trust me, it doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, it's just a code name, right? And so we've been using this for kind of what we call the view engine or the rendering engine in Angular. We've already changed this over twice. We've kind of changed the guts out entirely of how Angular works. We're gonna do that again, but we're gonna do it for some very different reasons. We're gonna do it in a very different way this time around. So, three things that are important here. First is that Ivy is significantly smaller, right? It's a much, much smaller framework, and not just smaller, but also pay as you go, meaning you know, you're only going to pay for the individual bit pieces of Angular that you actually use, which is a big win. Uh, again, it's significantly faster. Part of that is it's runtime faster. There's less work happening. There's less memory pressure. Generally, it's just very, very optimized. But also, of course, it's faster to boot up, right? Less code, less, net, less bytes over the network means your apps are going to start up faster. And then it's significantly simpler. And I think while smaller and faster are kind of the big headlines, simpler, I think, is the thing that's going to be really, really interesting uh, for both developers and your kind of end users. So part I want to talk about today is how we're thinking about Ivy, a little bit about how it works, and then also what that is going to allow you to do in the future. And we'll talk about that in the context of Elements, which is the project that I'm working on at the moment. So here's the headline number, right? Very simple Angular application, just the sort of basic hello world, 2.7K, right? And obviously we realize that no application is ever going to be 2.7K. Nothing in the real world actually works like this. But really what this number is about is a demonstration of that pay-as-you-go philosophy, right? If you only use one piece of Angular, that should be all you have to pay for. And so this is kind of just, that's a number that we really keep a benchmark on. We have a, you know, an integration test that watches that this number doesn't change. But in general, this is just a, a checkpoint to say, okay, are we doing things in a true shakeable way? And then we use that to verify that. Kind of a more realistic number is this 12.2 number. And so this is like a to-do MVC application. You may have seen the demo of this. And this is really exercising kind of all of the features of Angular, right? So this is using binding and ng4, and it's using classes and all the things that, that an Angular application is typically going to use, right? Kind of the basic Angular platform stuff. That only costs you 12.2K. And I think, again, this is a very, very interesting number because it changes some of the conversations. And it may begin to change some of the way that you think about Angular. So uh, we announced at ng-conf that we were doing this, and that line, that today line at ng-conf was probably you know, an inch or two to the left. We're nearly done with the runtime of Ivy. We're pretty much done with the instruction set. We're reasonably happy with where, where it's landing. I say that, there was a big change that landed last night. So this is still being developed, it's still in flux. But more or less, we're pretty close to being done with the runtime itself. I'll come back to the runtime in just a second. Uh, we are in the middle of working on the template compiler, right? And so this is that same compiler engine that we have. We want to make sure that all the code that you've written today will go through the compiler. We can generate Ivy-style code, right, without breaking it. So we're actually writing two brand new compilers because apparently that's what the Angular team just loves to do. All we do is write compilers all the time. So we've got two new compilers coming down the pipeline. Uh, one of those is what we call the NGCC, which is the Angular Compatibility Compiler. And then what this means is that we basically kind of fundamentally changed how Angular works under the hood. But obviously, we made this guarantee to everybody that we don't want to break your code, that we want your code to, you know, backwards compatible. And so we're building one compiler whose job it is to kind of take the old style of Angular, the old metadata-driven style, and kind of just do a code gen to the new Ivy style, right? And so this will be a, a middle ground that you'll be able to use kind of in the interim. Uh, and of course, there's a brand new compiler, which is much simpler, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but that compiler is going to be much faster, it's going to be much simpler, and it's really just a very simple TypeScript transform. So there's a lot of really good engineering wins under the hood in the compiler. And then the, la the last step we'll do is actually Google verification, right? So we have, you know, 800 plus apps at Google running this, and so we'll make sure that we can run all of these compiler steps, make sure that that code doesn't break. And when we're happy that that's been verified kind of at the Google level, then we'll consider shipping it to the outside world. Now, you can play with this stuff today, and I may, if I have time at the end of this, we may get into a little bit of that. But in general, like, the runtime is done, you can start to play with the runtime today, the template compiler is halfway done or so, and then we'll begin verification, we hope, kind of later in the summer. So again, IB render, this is kind of the big thing. The one kind of primary tenet that I just want to point out here, because a lot of people ask us how this is different, how has this changed, and I think Often we don't talk too much about how the Angular internals work. I don't want to dive too deeply into them today. 
but I just want to give you a little bit of idea about how we're thinking about them, what's changed, and hopefully what that will allow you to do in the future. So tree shaking, if you don't know this term, is basically you have a module like this. You know, it exports functions. You may only use that top level function, right? And ideally what we want is if you don't use the other function here, this unused function, then it should be removed from your bundle, right? You shouldn't have to pay the cost of that code. Your user shouldn't have to pay that cost of that code if your app isn't using that, that bit of code. So, you know, we can bring stuff in here and you can see we're gonna import some function. We're not gonna use the unused function. We'll call the sum function and tooling generally is able to figure out that, okay, we're using some function, it's actually being called. Unused function isn't, so we should be able to remove it, right? This is kind of tree shaking 101. Rollup does this, Webpack does this, Uglify does a little bit of this. So this is just how your apps are getting smaller in general. Now, what happens though is if you get a little bit too clever, so in this case, we've got a runtime check here that's saying if this is true at runtime, then do, you know, use the, the, go ahead and use the unused function. Now, we all write code like this all the time, right? But the problem here is that there's no way to know at build time whether or not X is true, right? And so there's no way to know statically up front does the unused function actually get called or not, and therefore can we eliminate it from the bundle or not? And actually, there's a lot of code in Angular today that looks like this. So the Angular 2 kind of rendering pipeline, and we call this Renderer 2 or the Render 2 pipeline. This is today's existing view engine. Uh, basically what we do is we take your template HTML, we run it through the compiler, we get this sort of template AST, this set of template data, and today what we do is we actually run it through an interpreter. So we kind of take this template at HTML, we turn it into this data structure, this kind of set of arrays inside of arrays, and then when we actually run change detection, when we run your app, what we're doing is we're kind of running this array through an interpreter. And that then actually gives you the final DOM. Right? And so this looks something like this. This is, again, how Angular works today. You've got a div, we run that through the compiler, and you get this generated code here. And this generated code is exactly the same stuff that's in your bundles today. You don't typically see this because the CLI kind of hides it all away, right? But when we talk about AOT, this is what we're talking about. So we take this kind of view definition, we put all the instructions in here that, that build up the template, right? And then what we do today is we basically just loop over it, right? So we take that view, which is just an array of all the stuff that we care about, and then we iterate over, over this array, right? And kind of update everything. And you can see this code has the exact same problem as the code we just looked at, right? Where we're doing this runtime check is something true or not? If it is, then you know, call this imported function. We have that same problem here, right? So if you run code like this, the nature of having an interpreter is that you're gonna have to have all of these functions available in your bundle, right? So you can't eliminate any of them from the, the setup. And again, this is not optimal for, for smaller applications. This is not optimal for widgets. And generally, you may not care about this if you had a gigantic application, but we have this kind of hard limit that we're always gonna have to have all of Angular in the core. So again, this stuff, you know, we're not able to remove it if it's not actually being checked statically. So again, template data runs through the interpreter and that gives us the final DOM. In Ivy, we change that a little bit and we kind of remove this middle level abstraction. So instead of generating a data structure, which we run through an interpreter and execute instructions, we actually just generate the instructions directly. And so this is that same HTML template, right? And this time you're seeing what we're doing is actually in line just generating the steps. And you can read almost kind of top to bottom and follow along the HTML, right? There's a thing that says open this element. There's a text node that's kind of dropped inside of that element and then we're saying stop that element to end, right? Now, these are imported from Angular's core. So if you do not use the text instruction, right? And you're gonna use the text instruction. But if you didn't use the text instruction, then it wouldn't get imported because it wouldn't get written into this generated code, right? And so this kind of fairly simple minor change actually fundamentally lets us get rid of basically all of Angular unless you use it. So as whereas historically we've always sort of said let's put everything in the bundle and then try to eliminate it, this flips that over. So we just never bring the code in in the first place, right? Which makes a whole lot more sense in retrospect uh, to actually do things this way. So this makes it much more flexible, it makes it make smaller bundles, and I think in general it makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on inside of the, inside of the under the hood, right? So uh, these are just simple instructions, right? So this is kind of pseudocode of what these instructions look like, but we have these set of things that basically, you know, it creates an element. That create L node call there is kind of the logical tracking we're doing in the background, setting up attributes. So these are very simple instructions. They look almost exactly like this in the actual real code base. And again, they're pure functions, so if you don't call them, if they're not referenced, they just get eliminated from the bundle, which is nice. 
again, so there's probably at this point about 12 or 15 different instructions, things like containers and creating listeners and using pipes, right? Again, if you don't use these, you don't import them, you don't write any code that uses pipes, then we don't have to pay the cost of the pipe code, which is nice. So what this means is that actually, what you know is the framework of Angular, right? Which we've always sort of always considered this one big solid unit that's all one big piece and it all works really nicely together, right? Which we like, but again, right now you're paying for all of this stuff all the time. And so in Ivy, it actually allows us to get rid of everything if we don't want to, right? So if you're not using Angular's DI, you don't pay the cost for it all. If you're not using content projection or, you know, queries or pipes, this stuff just gets eliminated from the bundle, right? So this is a big shift but it really allows us to think about Angular in a very, very different way. And in the short term, this is not gonna change too much, but we feel like it's gonna open up a whole bunch of really, really interesting options. So again, key thing here, it's much smaller, only pay for what you use, and much, much simpler, right? So human readable, and probably more important, human understandable code, right? It's nice if you can look at the code that's being generated and have some idea what's going on, because often today, it's not quite so easy. How do we do this? I don't want to dive too deeply into this because honestly the details are really, really boring, but in general we have this new concept of what we call locality. So today when you write an Angular application, right, using ng modules and you're kind of importing ng modules to other ng modules and exporting them, and really what you're doing there is building up a graph of all the available stuff in your application. So now your directives and what selectors they use and your components and what selectors they use. And this has given us some really powerful capabilities. It gives us really nice things like you know, inline, uh, inline template type checking, inline autocomplete in your templates. But unfortunately, it has this side effect that you really have to know about the whole entire application to be able to do anything, right? To be able to make any of these decisions, you have to understand the whole program. And because of the way that TypeScript works, that means you have to basically understand all of the TypeScript code in your project all at once. And so I think maybe two years ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, we made a promise to you, right? We said we want to make AOT the defaults. And unfortunately, what happened to us is that we got to a point where this older kind of non-local architecture really just prevented us from doing that. Like it was a mathematical impossibility. It didn't matter how much engineering time we put into it, and we put a lot of engineering time into it. We really got to a point where we, were just, we just couldn't get any faster. And it's fast, right? It's two, three seconds, but that's not good enough, especially as projects scale at Google. So this idea of locality, right, is basically we're able to look at one TypeScript file at a time irrespective of anything else in the application, and think about it, compile it, transform it completely independently, which means that we can paralyze this, it means that rebuilds get faster, it means that things become easier to reason about, it gets a lot simpler for both developers and the kind of engineering, uh, Angular engineering team. So, some of the interesting changes that are coming down this, and now my animations are all out of order, so we'll see how this goes, uh, but first of all, we're gonna be able to ship AOT compiled code to NPM. Right? And this is really nice because this means that people who want to consume code, if they want to consume an Angular element that you've built, for example, it's just going to be available on NPM. They don't have to bring it down and compile it, which is really nice. That'll be a bit, again, simplicity, not having to worry too much about what compilation is. It'll just be part of your kind of down-leveling to TypeScript or from TypeScript to JavaScript process. Uh, AOT and JIT will sort of kind of this difference that we have today will more or less eventually disappear. It's a much simpler mental model, and I actually like to kind of change this to say, rather than AOT versus JIT, which kind of implies a certain set of things, what you're able to do is a lot more dynamic linking. And really when people ask for sort of dollar sign compile back, which is the number one feature request we get at the moment, really what people want is to be able to dynamically assemble views, right? So you have an existing set of directives, an existing set of components, and you want to build a dynamic form out of them, right? That stuff is kind of hard to do today. It requires you to have quite a bit of knowledge about the AOT compiler, about the JIT compiler, about how to link these things up, about module factories, and a whole bunch of stuff you probably shouldn't have to worry about, right? So we'll simplify that. It gets a whole lot simpler conceptually. Things like metadata that's, you know, the bane of all of our existences is much, much simpler. In general, this whole metadata.json thing that we're all doing with NPM files, that goes away. You don't have to do anything crazy when you ship these things to NPM. And I should say, we had a lot of good reasons for this. And in general, this is just an evolution of us learning from Angular, us talking to developers and going, yeah, that's really frustrating for people. Can we make this easier? So the metadata kind of idea just goes away, which will be nice. The other one that's a really big win, and I think probably almost more important, or maybe the most important things, is we no longer are gonna have these separate ng factory files. And again, if you're using the CLI every day, you may never 
may, you may never have seen these files, uh, but they are the generated code that Angular generates. And it really doesn't make a big difference. You don't see them. Most of the time, we hide them away. But there's this one case that comes up all the time. I already talked about faster compiles here. And that case is things like lazy loading and doing fancy metaprogramming. And so if you've ever done this, right, you import one of your ng modules, some file, what's actually happening under the hood is we're actually rewriting that code to be this different file that you may or may not have known actually existed. Again, we hide this way most of the time, but if you want to do lazy loading, for example, all of a sudden it's a nightmare, right? Because you're not able to just say, import this file and give me the symbol out of it. What you actually have to say is, well, I'm going to ask you for this file, and then basically a miracle is going to occur, and then we're actually going to get the ng factory file, right? So it's this kind of really weird black box. You don't really understand what's happening. So this will go away. And instead, lazy loading in Angular kind of IV will look something like this, right? So we're just using the completely standard ES import syntax, much easier. There's no crazy ng factory stuff here. It just works exactly as you'd expect it to, which is a big win. So again, all this stuff is going to be backwards compatible. We're building a backwards compatibility compiler. We're going to make sure that we validate that with all these big projects at Google that are using you know, Angular as it exists today. We're already testing this with a couple of them. Google Shopping Express there is using Elements, so we're kind of playing with some really new tech for them. I think, though, that backwards compatibility is kind of boring, right? Like, cool, you're not going to break my stuff. That's great. That's the reason we're doing what we're doing. But, you know, interestingly, I think that there are more things that we should be looking at than just backwards compatibility. So let's assume, check, we're going to have back, backwards compatibility sorted. And looks forward a little bit maybe towards Elements. So Elements is a project that I've been working on. This is this idea of taking Angular components, being able to spit them out as custom elements, right, as web components. And this means you can consume them in any application, any framework, any page that you want. This is a really big win. If you're able to just put them on the page, set attributes on them. So let's look at kind of typical Angular component here, right? So really what you want to be able to do is this, right? I want to be able to use a component like this. And so really what I'm able to do is just write a component, right? We've got a template. We've got selectors, right? We've got inputs and outputs, all the kind of regular stuff you'd expect to have in an Angular component. And if you're building an Angular element, a web component out of this, this is really where you want to stop, right? Like this should be all you have to do. Unfortunately, right? What you're actually going to have to do is create another ng module here. You're going to have to bring in this browser module thing. This has all the dependencies you need. You have to declare this thing. You have to add it to the entry components. And this does some more special magic to make this thing available. We have to add this ng to bootstrap method. And then we want to actually bootstrap the thing up, right? So we're going to have to bring in the platform. And we'll start up a platform. And then we'll pass the, you know, the module to the platform. But of course, wait, if we're in AOT mode, right, then we have to change that code slightly. And we've got to add a different file and add a different bootstrap call. And then once we've bootstrapped it, right, okay, now we need to get an injector. Now we've got our element. We can go ahead and use this create custom element using the injector. And then finally, actually register the thing as a custom element. So this works today. And this is kind of the nature of how Angular is, right? Angular elements really was a, I don't want to say an afterthought, but it's a, it's a very different way of thinking about how Angular works as opposed to the kind of big application we've been typically building. So this is another way of doing it, right? But again, like, you're yeah, dealing with things that you really don't care about. I don't care about modules here. I just want to think about a component, right? I don't really want to mess with all this stuff. So again, this is a slightly shorter hand way of doing it. But here, we're always starting a platform, right? We're always dealing with these module factories. It gets complicated. Really, what we'll be able to do is just this, right? Put it on the page, put some attributes on it, use it. And then be able to actually just use it like an HTML element going forward, right? So, we can document create element for it. We can add it to the DOM. We can set properties on it. We can set attributes on it. You know, we can actually do clever things here. So I'm actually grabbing the constructor here from the custom elements registry. And I'm creating a new instance of it and maybe passing in the initial props, right? Makes it a little more flexible. We can add event listeners, right? So this is an output event getting fired out of the component and just listening to it as a standard event listener thing. So we have to do all this work, right? Not ideal. But really, like, we don't want to do all this work stuff, right? We don't want to mess with this stuff. We just want to think about a component kind of by itself. And why is this? Why does this work this way it is? Why do I have to create a platform and a module and a module ref and all this? A lot of this has to do with the dependency injection. And really, the architecture of Angular today is we have this kind of stack, right? So we have the platform injector. This is that platform browser thing you're starting up. 
It's got things like the renderer for the DOM and the sanitizer, and then your individual modules, right? Each of them have an injector, and they've got the individual services, and they're keeping track of engine module factories. And then individual components, or, you know, an individual element, they have their own injector. So you kind of get this hierarchy of injectors, this, this really useful structure of hierarchical DI. But again, it means like if I don't care about this stuff, if I'm not actually using any of the stuff like this, if I just want simple rendering, I'm still paying the cost both in bytes and kind of mentally of all of this stuff, right? Whereas really we want to be able to just say, you know, get me the constructor, create me a new instance of it and add it to the DOM, right? Or optionally pass an injector if we want to. The problem with this is that, you know, if we look at this, I have a place to pass in an injector here, right? I have some place to say, here's your parent injector. But if I use a custom element this way, I don't have any space to put that in, right? The browser is creating this element, it's not giving me the constructor, and it's just kind of being created. So I have no way to pass in context from the outside world. Which means we have to do all that kind of, all those shenanigans earlier on to get this, this thing registered in the right definition. So we've been using this for a while, actually. Uh, I get asked a lot, like, are these things ready to go? Yes, they are. If you've been using Angular.io, for example, we've been using custom elements on Angular.io, now the screen has gone off. We've been using custom elements uh, on Angular.io for about three months now. And we've actually seen almost no issues with this. Like, we've had very few error reports. I'm sure now five people are going to come and tell me that they had an error on it. Um, but actually, we've been really impressed with how well this works, even with the polyfills. Again, if you've not seen this in Angular.io, we all have this HTML templating, right? This is not Angular components. This is just kind of standard HTML. And then we're embedding these sort of interactive widgets, right? So this is like a code wrapper, and this is a tab panel, right? And so these are Angular components nested in HTML. Turns out this is like the ideal use case for Angular elements as they exist today. So we use this to kind of validate the whole process. We're pretty happy where that's going. Again, that's another Angular component there. You can check these out on our website. Uh, all of these things are custom elements. You can poke around and see some of the very powerful stuff we're doing with these. Just as a note, it took us, I think, three hours to migrate all of this, all of these custom elements from the old way of doing things, the new way of doing things, and that also involved deleting like a thousand lines of code, which was always a nice win. So definitely have a look at this to see kind of what we're doing. I like to do this slide every time because all of our friends except Edge have shipped support for custom elements. Uh, if this is something you care about, I would greatly appreciate you going to the user voice site for Edge and upvoting custom elements. They are currently the number one most upvoted thing on Edge's user voice, but continue to do that. We're going to continue to put pressure on them. Uh, the good news is that even if you want to use IE with this stuff, the polyfills are available back to IE 9. Uh, one note here, and this is kind of one of these things where now we begin to see the rough edges, right? So content projections, this is the NG content stuff. Well, in elements, it kind of works, right? And again, this is because Angular today was designed with, and ng content was designed with this very static model in mind, right? Where we understand your entire application, we can do everything really statically. So we're looking at slots and shadow DOM right now. This should simplify a lot of how we do content projection. Again, this makes it really useful for dynamic stuff. If you've not seen slots before, slots work almost exactly like ng content. In this case, we're going to add a new view encapsulation there. That's the shadow DOM. Encapsulation. This will use the new version of Shadow DOM. We can do slots on the page, so slot, slot. Put some content in it. This is just transclusion or ng content, but this is baked into the browser now. This is actually working dynamically. We can have name slots, so I can say this slot has a name of header, and this slot has a name of main. So it gives us a place to put individual content in a template. When we use it, we can then say, you know, put this span in the header slot and put this span in the main slot. Very useful for composition. So we're going to add this probably to v7. Again, this will be part of the IV design work, will be, will be slots. Uh, again, we can target it here. One of the cool things is that if you don't put any content in here, you can say I have some default content. That hello name is the default content. And so if I don't put a header in there, we'll actually see that default, which is nice. So this is the thing that I'm basically spending all of my time on at the moment. I've been sitting in Tel Aviv on a beach hacking on this, which has been really, really, really nice. Uh, and basically, this to me is kind of the culmination of really two very powerful work streams that are going on. And I think that this actually hope, hopefully demonstrate how much simpler things are going to become. So this is what rendering a component looks like in Ivy. So you can see, A, it's a heck of a lot shorter, right? We're bringing in basically two things. We're bringing in a render component method from the Angular core library, and this is part of Ivy. 
And then we're bringing just my hello world component, right? Notice there are no ng modules here. There are no factories here. There are no rewrites going on here. There's literally just the render component method and the component. So we can actually add options to this, right? So we can say, cool, here's the host I want you to connect to, the options I want to use. This is just a very, very simple version of render this component onto the specific elements. So if we were going to make one of these things up, right? So let's assume the Angular team wasn't going to build custom elements. Could I do that myself, right? And so this is more or less what I've been building out here is a very, very simple wrapper. So basically all I'm doing, and I'm literally I'm using the exact same render component method here, and I'm basically saying when this custom element connects to the page, just call the render component method, add the component, and pass the host, and inside of a custom element, this is the host, right? So this gives us, like, basically Angular elements in five lines of code. There's no special support here. We're going to build a much more robust version of this, but the point of this is that this is incredibly simple. There's not a whole lot going on here. There's no factories or modules or platforms or any of this stuff. It's literally just, I have a component. I'm going to render it. I'm going to wrap it in a custom element. So it's much, much simpler. So HTML element, we can do the change section that way. We can do attributes change this way. Ideally, we want to add a flag to the compiler, so this is very speculative, but custom element true, great. We'll do a compiler thing, we'll spit it out. We can actually individually do mix-ins for this. We're looking at giving you templates by themselves, so just an Angular component or just an Angular element with a template, maybe not a component, should be simple. And we think that, again, this kind of 10K number we've talked about a lot, we think that when you hit this 10K threshold, things become very interesting. You can use Angular components, Angular elements in a way where right now you might be scared to use them because they're too big, they're too complicated. We think this 10K number will make them be able to use basically anywhere in a very, very straightforward fashion. So in general, we think the future is very flexible. In general, we want to make Angular much more usable for all kinds of situations that are not single page applications. We're doing a lot of work on this right now. And please remember again that we're not going to forego single page applications. That's our bread and butter. That's what we get paid for. Right? But we want to make sure Angular is much, much more flexible for everybody in the future. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Sorry about the technical details. And I will be around, and please come talk to me if you need anything after the fact.